Hello. Welcome. Um, my name is Inder Kibros, and I'm here a professor of media innovation here in Tallinn University. And my job today is chair this session, our, our keynote of today. And uh, regarding that, we are uh, ex very, very honored um, to have as our keynote today Jose van Dijk, who is a distinguished professor in uh, Utrecht University. And until June, uh, June, so two months ago, was the, was the president of the Royal Academy of Science of Netherlands. And I'm sure mo almost all of you know that uh, Jose has been um, author of many of the highly well-received books in, uh, in the areas of, um, of, of platform studies, of, of connectivity, of, uh, of uh, online behaviors of both companies and citizens. Um, and uh, her uh, most recent, or not even recent, but the upcoming book that uh, comes out in, uh, in only two months uh, on platform society, I'm um, sure will be highly, highly popular and well, well received as well. And uh, her talk today, titled um, Public Values and the Common Good in an Online World, touches upon these same very topics. So we are all very excited to hear uh, your talk. Thank, Thank you. you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Estonia and my first time in Tallinn. And I would like to thank Indrik and especially Ramona for all her wonderful work. And all, you know, you brought me here and it's been a real good experience so far. So indeed, I will talk to you today about public values and the common good in an online world. And I think it fits in very well with, your, with the theme of, you know, the cultural governance of global flows, which is the conference team. My talk will be mostly about um, uh, global flows of information on which you know, a lot of cultural content is building. Um, so I'll be talking mainly about the infrastructure of that, um, you know, those glo global flows. Um, as some of you may know, you know this book, The uh, Culture of Connectivity, was uh, published five years ago, and that was a time when the, uh, you know, the euphoria about platforms, about online society, about social media, was still in full swing. Now, five years later, that euphoria has sort of dwindled, especially in the, over the past year and a half, basically, since you know, 2016. And ever since I've been working on that new book, which is called The Platform Society, it will be out in a month or so with Oxford University Press, and I co-authored it with uh, Thomas and Martijn, who are two of my, co uh, my colleagues. And my talk today will be based on that, you know, on that book, Partly, and I mostly invite all of your comments and you know all of your everything you wanted to ask. We can do that like in 45 minutes. I will try to stick to the time. Um, this article appeared in Foreign Policy, an American, uh, you know, famous American journal, in May, just last May, and it basically said Hollywood culture is now waning. The tech companies, the American tech companies particularly, are mostly defining America's image. But that, you know, there's three problems with that. First of all, there's disinformation, fake news and hate speech. You know, you've seen everything, you know, from uh, hate speech on YouTube to fake news and the problem that that caused for Facebook. Um, secondly, intervention in democracy. We've, have, we've had, of course, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. And finally, also the surrender of uh, individual privacy. Now that, you know, we've seen this with the GDPR coming into uh, effect last May, but privacy has been a long-standing issue with these platforms. Now, the conclusion of this article is more or less um, long-standing values that were promoted by US culture, the values of tolerance, of democracy, individual rights, they're currently compromised by cultural export, mostly, you know, brought to us by these American companies. However, the US, I think, is still 
is, is very dominant in providing the infrastructure for the distribution of cultural goods. Cultural goods meaning news, video, social talk, private communication, etc., etc. So I'll be talk talking mostly today about that uh, American uh, private, of, uh, uh, private company, corporately owned ecosystem. Um, basically, you know, this is the major questions that I will be asking today. Can you read this okay? I'm just wondering if the slides, yeah? Okay, well, you, ha you have to screen the screens up the, uh, upstairs. Um, if tech companies are really ruining um, Americans' image as bearers of cultural values, as that foreign policy article uh, was indicating, such as tolerance and democracy, what would be the impact on the rest of the world, particularly on Europe? So this question basically will guide my talk. How can European societies guard public values and the common good in an online world? And that online world is now dominated by mostly American tech companies. So first of all, I will guide you through five parts of my talk. We'll, I will explain to you what e platform ecosystems are, what they do, how they situate, and how they, um, more or less in terms of polit political economy, you know, rule the world. Uh, secondly, I will be talking about platform mechanisms, which is a lot more technical in terms of how flows of information are governing that system, that ecosystem. Then we'll come to public values and especially responsible actors who are supposed to make that system work, right? And I'll be uh, pointing out some major complex challenges that are ahead of us in the European situation particularly. So let's start with that global online world and how two, particularly two ecosystems are basically sort of, you know, uh, facilitating all kinds of global flows of information. And those flows of information are dominated by either by states or by companies, and mostly by a combination of the two. Now, there's two major, major platform ecosystems that dominate the world. The first is the Chinese ecosystems, ecosystem, and China, of course, has its own system that is controlled by the state, but that is operated by its own big five companies. And these are the big five companies that operate that system. It's Alibaba, most of you know the names, you know they're quite familiar in uh, Western Europe as well. Uh, Alibaba, which is basically the Chinese Amazon. There's Tencent, the biggest company in China, that, out, that comes out of China, which operates WeChat, for instance. There's Baidu, uh, Jingo Dong Mall, Jide Com, and Didi, which is more or less the Chinese Uber. Now, Alibaba and Tencent, they're becoming currently extremely powerful. And they're basically doing that by branching out of their basic core business, all of them, and branching out into pretty much every sector of society. The Chinese system may look like self-contained, but it's definitely sort of branching out into European, American, and you know, all, all, all across the world in different um, uh, branches. Now, the thing is that not just in China, but you know, as they spread around the world, they're becoming gatekeepers to the entire economy, not just to a, you know, um, an economic system, but you know, the entire economy, they're wielding power also over brick and mortar companies. Um, true, for instance, you know, like Baidu has pay systems, uh, communication channels, but they're also buying up grocery stores, pharmacies, they're getting very active in the health sector, and so on and so forth. Now, in the Chinese ecosystem, the state has strict power over companies. So, you know, control is very much resting with the state. And actually, perhaps ironically, but the large uh, size of those companies makes it also easier for the authorities, the Chinese authorities, to control those information uh, flows. I could talk for at least two hours just about the Chinese system, but I won't do that today. You know, you can ask me at some other time to do that, and I will definitely do that in you know, later work. But we're going to look at the American uh, ecosystem today, although the two are you know, very much intertwined, and I'll may come back to that a little later. But America, of course, has its own platform ecosystem, and that is dominated by the big five 
tech companies that you're all familiar with. Is there anyone in this room that has never used any of the services of these big five companies? <laughs> I'm always curious because there may always be, ah, there's one hand. Um, I'm going to talk to you later because I'm pretty <laughs> sure Okay, I'm pretty sure, even if you wave your hand now, that I, you know, after talking to you for like a little less than one minute, I will be make sure that you have used one of those services. So, because you're probably not even aware of how many of these services you're actually using. Now, this system, of course, dominated by those five companies, Alphabet, Google being uh, pretty much the largest one, although not in, uh, uh, Apple is actually the biggest one in terms of uh, turnover. Uh, they dominate the rest of the markets in Europe and Asia, Africa and South America. And these American tech companies, they have tried, of course, to enter the Chinese ecosystem. And over the past 10 years, they've been doing that, you know, more or less successful and more successfully. Over the past few weeks, Google has tried to enter the market again. And, but of course, you know, they were either barred or there were um, imposed censorship rules that they didn't want. And it has been, a, you know, quite a struggle between these systems to sort of, you know, to become more intertwined. Um, Uber, for instance, uh, uh, not here in this system, but has taken a stake in Didi, and Didi has taken a stake in Uber. And uh, Didi, by the way, is controlled by Tencent. So the Chinese are obtaining stakes in the American system. The Americans are obtaining stakes in the uh, Chinese system. So it's going back and forth. And I could talk forever about this interference, but I won't, as I promised. What about Europe? Because that's going to be my main you know, point of convergence and, att and attention. Um, squeezed in between that US and the Chinese system is, of course, the European continent. And Basically, the major complaint is that in Europe, we have no major technology companies, which is true because, you know, the corporate headquarters of the largest players um, by market capitalization, they're unevenly spread geographically. As you can see, 47% of them are in Asia, 36% in North America, and only 15% in Europe. Now, any of you know what there's only one major European platform in Europe that... Uh, that actually that is European in nature, and that is uh, part of the, the, the top 50 of major platforms. Do you know which one it is? Spotify. Okay, you probably knew because I had a star there, right? <laughs> that little spot means Spotify. So it's the spot for Spotify. Um, so this means that Europe has become largely dependent on American plat the American platform ecosystem, and particularly for its infrastructural services. Now, in spite of the fact that Europe has, you know, despite these numbers, we do have a few unicorns. And I've learned here since I've been in Estonia, well, actually, I knew that, but Taxify is one of the Estonian companies that has become a unicorn. And, of course, Skype, but that was bought up by Microsoft just, you know, a couple of years ago. So... There's a few countries that have uni unicorns and that have developed, you know, basically part of that infrastructure, but most of it has been either bought up by one of, two, uh, one of the two systems. So therefore, you know, we really need to think what European societies want from American technologies, or mostly American technologies. And, um, you know, we often hear from American CEOs working for these companies, Peter Thiel here, who is uh, uh, saying that, oh, you know, Europe is cracking down on Silicon Valley out of jealousy. You hear this a lot from American CEOs. Europe is just jealous. You know, they should just cope with that, but they're jealous. I happen to take a different view on that, but European societies, I think, they mostly favor a different model of governance, which we call the Rhineland model. And that sort of model, you know, is, you know, basically governing the uh, Western European welfare states. Such societies with that Rhineland model, they have substantial public spaces. They have substantial public sectors. And as a matter of fact, the American platform ecosystem hardly allows for public space and for the public sector to develop. So public values and the common good they're not simply not part of that American ecosystem's architecture. So that, you know, I will be focusing on that for uh, over the next few minutes. Here you have those, 
this American-based platform ecosystem driven by the five, the big five corporate players. Now, in terms of market value, those five players, they form the world's fifth largest economy right now, after the US, China, uh, Germany, and Japan. So together, they are the, big, the, the, fifth, the world's fifth biggest player. But actually, for me, it's not just about market power. It is about societal power that you know, we're talking about here. Societal power and influence. And those big five actually increasingly serve as gatekeepers. They act as gatekeepers to all kinds of social and economic and cultural and personal activities. So that is mostly you know, the influence that I'm interested in, despite of you know, their huge economic impact. Why is that so important? Well, those big five corporations, um, you may not be able to read the small print here, but I you know, can send you this slide later so you can, you can read it. But those big five, they operate in strategic online infrastructural platforms. And we have tried to map here you know, a number of these services, about a you know, hundred of these services, that we could call infrastructural platforms. For instance, we talk about you know, social networks, think Facebook or Google+, web hosting, about pay systems, uh, identification services, cloud services, advertising agencies, search engines, navigation, maps, uh, app stores, analytic services, AI divisions, etc., etc. There are a number, and there are an increasing number of what we call infrastructural platforms that without those services, you could not build platforms upon that, you know, basic infrastru infrastructure. So, basically, societies across the globe have become dependent on this infrastructure for organizing all kinds of societal sectors. Not just private sectors, not just retail, not just, you know, taxi services, but public sectors. Think health, think education. And there's currently a debate going on, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but uh, whether these kind of services may be defined as public utilities. You know, like we have our basic offline infrastructures, like railways or, uh, you know, whatever kind of infrastructures offline. Actually, this is a very complex discussion because for lawmakers, you know, if you go into that discussion, you see how difficult it is to define what public utilities really are, what they do. So I will skip that discussion for now, but it's, it is an ongoing and very intriguing discussion. Um, besides owning those infrastructural platforms, which are here now in the middle, I've now zoomed out of those infrastructural platforms, they've also become major operators of sectoral platforms. You know, various sectors, the big five, also own and operate in uh, major societal sectors. And these sectors, sectoral platforms, are actually increasingly interwoven with the infrastructural services. So for the book that uh, we've just finished, that will come out next month, we have researched four different sectors, two private, uh, urban transport and news are basically, you know, can be considered private sectors, and two public, health and fitness and education. And we did that primarily to see how, you know, how m many of these platforms, these infrastructural platforms, have managed to infiltrate, in, uh, penetrate these sectoral systems. Now, for instance, if you look at the color coding, it's quite intricate. You need some time to study this, so I don't blame you if you don't get it first sight. But they're all color coded, and we have tried to inventorize how many of these sectoral uh, sectors are infiltrated with, uh, you know, the big five uh, sectoral platforms. For instance, um, take Google. Uh, Google has, of course, an education, has now not only Google Scholar, but has Google Apps for Education, Google Suite for Education. It's becoming increasingly more um, uh, powerful in the sector of education. Uh, in, of course, urban transport, Google Maps is as, as extremely efficient and well used. Uh, look at news, Google News, a very important filter of the news that you get on your phone. Um, and of course, in health, um, Google Genomics and um, especially DeepMind, which has just been bought up you know, by Google, is a very important player in, uh, in health. Now, 
they have done this, you know, through, for instance, partnerships, through buying stakes in each other. Google has a 20% stake in Uber, for instance. Um, and, for instance, it has shares in uh, 23andMe, which is owned by the former wife of, ex-wife of uh, Sergey Brin. But, I mean, there are all kinds of partnerships, lines, ownership, relationship. It's, it's like an intricate, you know, complex of relationships between the companies and the sectors. Now, of course, platformization, as I call this process, is not just happening in those four sectors. Those are just examples. It happens in all kinds of sectors, in finance, in retail, in hospitality, in food. In, you know, Am Amazon just bought Whole Foods, of course. So, you know, it's just, you know, these sectors that we took as an example. But platformization, you know, it doesn't just happen through ownership relations, and, but also through partnerships, and more importantly, through data sharing deals. I'll come back to that a little later. Um, online power, basically, between those platforms, happens not just within sector, uh, uh, infrastructural platforms, but between infrastructures and sectors, and between sectors. And that makes those, you know, that platform ecosystem that makes the players, the owners of that system, so incredibly powerful. So, for instance, just to stick to Google, Google owns search and analytics as infrastructural services, but it also owns Google Health and Google Classroom. It owns Google Shopping. And, you know, in each of these sectors, they own uh, the data analytics that make them increasingly more powerful to actually you know, uh, run this system, basically. So, you know, it's not just that these sectors have silos, but in between those silos, they're becoming more powerful. Okay, so this was just a sort of a, a, a rushed political economic analysis, and you will forgive me that I won't go into details, because I'm actually more interested in uh, platform, what I call platform mechanisms. They're the technicalities. If you look under the hood of your car, you usually don't know what's there, and that's the kind of mechanisms that we have been most interested in for researching this system. Now, to understand how platforms work, we need to look into those mechanisms because, you know, they facilitate more or less the operation of other platforms, right? So it's a system that is facilit uh, facilitating. But, you know, facilitating doesn't mean that it's neutral or agnostic. Uh, built into this system are platform mechanisms that are... Um, that steer basically all online traffic. So it's not neutral, but it's you know very much built into that system are a number of rules. And we have, you know, there's a number of, of mechanisms. I can't you know bother you with that today, but we have identified three major categories of mechanisms. One is datification, the other one is commodification, the next one is selection. Um, let me take you very briefly through each of those, and then you probably understand what I'm talking about. Datafication is basically the algorithmic governance of data flows. And that, of course, are those data flows are gener those data are generated each and every day by users like you, and they're processed by the hardware and software that is owned by these five companies. Especially software analytics play a really big role in that. So that's why I pointed it out. Um, the very, very big question here is, of course, who controls data flows? Where do data go? Who you know owns them? What can you do with with data? For instance, Facebook. Uh, well, you may you may or may not know this. It's sharing its data with at least 60 device makers. So your data are constantly shared with all these device makers. So it's not that they stay within you know the site of the, or the company that is uh, generating them. But algorithmic governance means that all of your daily activities are basically um, not only generated by these uh, uh, mechanisms, but they're also steering your life. Think about the like button, right? Your like button and your sharing button. They, they're not just buttons. They're not just, you know, innocent, neutral mechanisms. They actually do something to reality and they actually influence how people behave online. You know, if you give more likes to someone on YouTube, it becomes more commercially uh, interesting for people to invest in there. Um, so is the case with real-time and predictive analytics. 
uh, analytics, you know, they really define social outcomes. For instance, the more we, you know, is think about schools, learning analytics that are increasingly used in dashboards, for instance, to follow or monitor uh, children's developments in class or outside class. They're extremely important as to how children learn, but also how they are particularly pushed in a certain kind of learning. So when we look at these systems, you need to understand how analytics are not simply uh, neutral mechanisms, but how they're steering whatever we do in terms of social activities. So there's a lot of consequences to that. Secondly, commodification. You probably, you know, I'm not telling you a secret that, you know, companies are trying to create online value out of data flows. That's their bread and butter. That's how they, you know, that's their basically their uh, their business model. Now, they've always done so. I mean, newspapers have been generating our attention and selling, you know, content for advertising and you know, it's basically buying our attention. But in the online world, there are a few things different, and particularly data and data flows are a very new type of currency in this world. The four types of currencies we have identified is data, users, money, and attention. And that is how the platform world is turned into what we call multi-sided markets, right? That's an economic term. But basically what they do, how they generate money, is how they produce value, commercial value, is by first unbundling a, an existing product, think a newspaper, unbundling that newspaper into single news articles, and then through the mechanisms, rebundling that into a new product, think your news feed in your phone. Right? So the activity of unbundling and then rebundling is what, how they add value to, uh, uh, to the product. Um, the free mo business models that we're now, we have now become used to are uh, sort of misleading. It's not free. You know, we understand free as, uh, as not, you know, you're not paying in terms of money for your in the information that you're getting free, but you're paying with data you're paying with attention, and you're paying with being a, f a faithful user of a platform. So that's how you pay your information. Next one is the last one. Once again, this is very brief, but is the, uh, the mechanism of selection. Selection mechanisms are manifold, but personalization is probably the, ones, the one that you're most familiar with. You know, your, your data, your data points more or less become personalized whenever you use uh, online media, online platforms. Uh, reputation mechanisms is something else, but for instance, in an Uber taxi, you're uh, constantly ranked as a driver, and that also drives your performance, and your performance may be the base of you know, how much you earn or how many uh, other customers you will be getting. So this is how it constantly works. Rankings, trends, uh, reputation, personalization, but um, if you only like sports, you will get sports. If you only click on fake news, you will get more fake news. So all of these ranking, trending, uh, reputation mechanisms um, are actually controlled, mostly invisible, invisibly, by the companies that own the algorithms, right? And we don't have access to these algorithms, so we can't see what is actually happening under the hood. These platform mechanisms are mostly based on commercial values, and those commercial values are, are built into the architecture of the platform ecosystem. Now, what about public values and the common good? Since, you know, we've been mostly focusing on that system and its, and, and its uh, commercial value, but how are public values anchored into that system? And I think that's a really important and basic question that the com these companies have been struggling with over the past year and a half. What do I mean by public values? Well, you know, you and I, when we use uh, social media, for instance, when we use platforms, we really expect them to inject basic public values into the online society, like things like security. We want our connections to be secure. We expect transparency to some extent. We want to know what we're doing and how we're being, uh, uh, information is being sold to us, right? Um, we want accuracy. If we use a health app, for instance, and it, it measures my heartbeat, I want to make sure that it's accurate, that it's not, you know, some kind of bogus that they're selling me. 
And of course, we want privacy, very important, especially in Europe. But these values, you know, they're not fixed values that you can buy in a store on, off the shelf. Values are something that, you know, they're negotiated. They're negotiated in a culture. They negotiated in each culture differently, and in each different context. So, and they're often, you know, they often are not just interchangeable. You have to negotiate one against another. So, for instance, the privacy of individuals. That may sit in tension with the security of in individuals, or transparency may sit in tension with privacy. That happens, for instance, when you, you know, and uh, well, there's this whole discussion with Airbnb, where the they actually argue that the privacy of their customers, their users, uh, that's why they cannot give their data to uh, local governments who want to. Uh, ask them, you know, to pay taxes on the tourists that they're facilitating. So there's this constant exchange of values. But these are just, you know, very specific values that pertain to this online uh, interactivity. But there's m many more values. For instance, beyond the uh, uh, um, uh, consumer values, we have values that pertain to society as a whole. Take, for instance, fairness. We want societies to be fair. We want them to be inclusive. We want them to be responsible. We want people to take responsibility and accountability for what they offer. You know, if you buy whatever product, you hold the seller accountable for what they sell, right? We want, you know, democratic control. We've been seeing that over the past year. It's become a very important value. Now, these kind of values, they are historically anchored in institutions, in sectors, in law, in, in sectoral laws, for instance, uh, but also in professional codes. In the offline world, that's where we negotiate about values. For instance, in journalism, public values are anchored in professional codes. For instance, we expect news to be accurate, we expect it to be fair, we expect comprehensive reporting. In education, we expect you know, schools to be accessible to everyone. We expect equal opportunity in learning. Uh, we also expect privacy. You're not going to give away your data to you know, anyone in the street. So there are all these kinds of values that pertain to you know, a democratic society as a whole. But the interesting thing is that over the past years, these connective platforms have been very good at bypassing or ignoring or simply dismissing what you know the uh, the uh, where values were before negotiated in these uh, contextual uh, societal areas so for instance facebook you know this was in 2016 right after the elections as you can see in the american elections facebook basically said it came under a lot of fire you know for the creation of course of filter bubbles and fake news and mark zuckerberg said well you know, Facebook is not a media company. We're, we do not produce news. The only thing we do, we only, the only thing we do is creating value by first unbundling and then rebundling news articles in your news stream, in news feed stream, right? That's the only thing we do. We do not, we do not bear responsibility for the production of news. That's what other uh, companies, etc., do. So, until 2017, Facebook simply refused to accept responsibility for uh, the content it's, uh, distribute, it's dist distributing. Although, in the meantime, more than 50% of Americans received their news through Facebook newsfeed, which is, you know, an incredible control over the distribution of news. Um, so let's talk about responsibility as one of these you know, important values. And now I come to responsible actors. Who is responsible for a fair and democratic platform society? And I will take you through this problem. It's a really wicked problem, the problem of fake news. And that's just an example of you know, how we need to negotiate about responsibility. If we talk about responsible actors, we're basically talking about three types of actors. First, of course, the market. Uh, we have companies, we have micro-entrepreneurs, businesses, large and small companies. Um, secondly, of course, we have state actors, not just you know, local governments, but national gov governments, supranational governments. The EU is a very important player in this. 
public institutions, now we get to the civil society sphere. You know, I think the civil society um, actors are sort of ignored in this whole scheme. I was just pointing out to you, we have this Chinese system, the American system. Of course, in the Chinese system, it's very easy. The state is controlling, the state actors are controlling uh, the ecosystem. In the American system, it is market actors that control those information flows. In Europe, I think we have, I pointed out to you, we have a different model. We have, we mostly favor the Rhineland model. And part of that is to create a balance between market forces, state forces, and particularly civil society forces. And that has been an aspect that has been very much ignored. Now, what we try, what I'm trying to show to you is that all of these different forces can ideally work together in multi-stakeholder organizations. But actors, you know, all of these actors, they may have a similar goal, a, 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 you know, a similar goal, but they do not have the same interests. They represent different interests. So, now, let me focus on that wicked problem of fake news to explain to you how, you know, we have to move from different, uh, a variety of, um, of actors. Market actors, well, you know, I told you, Facebook was starting finally to get, you know, accept more responsibility for the problem of uh, fake news. Uh, by the way, they didn't do that until they were forced to do that by advertisers, by users, and by whistleblowers, and especially, uh, you know, advertisers who didn't want to be next their advertisements to be next to fake news. So they were pretty much forced into defending their product. And that, of course, happened over the past year. Zuckerberg faced off with lawmakers, both in Brussels and in Washington, to defend his product for, you know, uh, 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 politicians. Um, well, I think both of these interrogations, both in Brussels and, and Washington DC, were quite a farce because a lot of these politicians and lawmakers didn't have the slightest clue as to how that ecosystem worked. But, you know, that's another question. The million dollar question, I think, is uh, if companies have rule setting power in that ecosystem, how can governments and the public impose certain public values on that system? Now, Facebook did, you know, a lot of things to sort of outsource their responsibility. They did that by, they asked legacy organizations, for instance, to flag fake news. Many of them refused, of course. You know, first they undercut their business model and now they're asking them to actually, you know, flag fake news. Hey, come on. Um, they also asked users to rank the credibility of news. That's what you're, uh, what you're seeing here. They hired 3,000 extra editors to train algorithms. So at least Facebook took some responsibility. However, they did not, you know, they refused simply to give access to, uh, for instance, algorithms. So openness in terms of, you know, showing people what their algorithms do, showing them what the business model looks like, that was not part of their uh, logics. So actually, you know, Despite the fact that if we look at Facebook and it's putting a lot of effort into, you know, now trying to avoid fake news, New York Times today, yesterday was full of, you know, stories about this. But the basic dilemma is, do we really want Facebook and its users to be the designated curators or editors of our news? That is a really big dilemma. State actors, right? Second one in my, in my scheme. In response to the fake news problem, European states certainly took action and mostly it was mostly Germany who, um, who was the first one to uh, present the draft law. They were going to impose legal sanctions on uh, uh, distributors of fake news. So basically European states in Holland, in uh, France and in Germany are now saying, well, you may not call yourself a news company, but you're pretty much responsible for what you distribute, so you better shape up your act, right? But then, you know, another um, part of the dilemma comes in, because do we really want states to censor news or to impose self-censoring mechanisms on these companies? That's, you know, I'm just trying to sketch the dilemma for you. 
civil society organizations, um, they have become very important and powerful in, you know, uh, well, powerful, I, I wish they had been, become more powerful, but there's several organizations in Europe right now that are trying to uh, work, you know, work on fake news and checking, for instance, by uh, uh, fact-checking the news. Wiki Tribune uh, by Jimmy Wales is one of them. Uh, Corrective is a German, um, um, a German civil society organization, and Meden. Uh, comes out of, I think it's uh, England. Uh, Meden is actually now starting to be supported by Google, and Corrective is actually was just started to be uh, sponsored by Facebook. So now we have another dilemma, <laughs> entering our already complex scheme of dilemmas, but if they work for or with these companies, can we still expect them to be independent? Because Facebook is now advertising, oh, we work with Meden, and you know they're fact-checking for us. But to what extent are they really independent? So I'm only going to make this dilemma more complex as we go. So citizens, people like you and me, we are part of this dilemma. Um, we have our own responsibility, you know, we can protest fake news as people, as citizens do here, but we're the ones clicking, right? We're the ones clicking these buttons. And, you know, the thing is, of course, citizens are also consumers and they like to click and they like to like because that's how they get more information and they're uh, obtaining these services. And basically what they're doing is they're trading privacy for convenience and for free information. Now. Another part of the dilemma is, can you make citizens, some people say, well, people are themselves responsible for fake news, but can you help citizens responsible for fake news? I mean, hey, come on, 60% of US users of Facebook, they do not recognize a sponsored story in, a face, in their Facebook news feed. That's how difficult it's made for them to actually recognize what fake news is. To make a long story short, this whole dilemma that I was just sketching with all these actors involved uh, was part of a, uh, a, a, a research, more or less a report, that was brought out by the European Union just last March, and it was called a multi-dimensional approach to disinformation. Um, all these stakeholders were part of that report and that part of that research. And you know, the actual outcome of this report, some say, well, you know, they're not saying anything, but it's basically, we have to build multi-stakeholder organizations and cooperate in order to solve this problem, which I think is true, but it's much easier said than done. So now we have to actually, you know, come around and do that. Um, fake news is just one of the many challenges that is facing us in the platform society. And there's many others. So. Let me take you to a few of those complex challenges, and I'm not pretending you know, whatsoever to solve these problems, I'm just wanting to pose them for you so you know how complicated this issue is. And we will be working for at least another you know, 10, if not 20 years to solve this. But it's, I think it's very profound. So um, first, I think the first complex uh, challenge for us is to assume assume a much more comprehensive approach to the ecosystem. Uh, so far, you know, a lot of countries, and uh, particularly European countries and the European Union, has considered what I call the platform society as a market. You know, they have brought out reports like uh, digitizing the European industry, uh, the, a digital single market, but platforms, of course, are not simply market mechanisms. They're penetrating, as I just said, all of our public sectors, our local governments, and so they need to be treated as part of an ecosystem as a whole. So we need to see complexity as a system that is in, in encompassing all of these public and private sectors. So this is one of these reports from the digital single market. I think it's a good beginning. I think Europe actually is one of the forces right now that is uh, most apt and most able to provide a counter power, counter force to you know, a balance to what we're seeing in uh, the global eco, uh, 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 clash of uh, global ecosystems. So this is a good beginning, but I think when we really want to talk about public values and the common good, we need to also include public sectors and public values in that equation. And that's, it's mostly still about economic value right now. As long as you talk about just about economic value, you're sort of ignoring these huge elephants in the room, which are you know, public values and things like fake news. Um, 
a second uh, recommendation that I have is that we need to articulate value-centric platform policies. We're not much used to doing that. You know, we basically it's a wild west in terms of how we uh, uh, go about platform policies. So I think that public values need to become part of the design of platforms. We call that value-centric design. So before you even design a platform, you need to articulate the values that need to go into that. For instance, we uh, accommodate privacy in the first place, and we do that in such and such way. You know, we want to have such and such um, uh, values in place for the use of, of data, for instance. You know, open data principles, for instance. You can articulate a number of values and include that in your platform policy design, whether you're private or public. I mean, it doesn't matter. Corpor corporations can do that and can actually build their brands on uh, pub public value by design. Some corporations are already doing that. Um, here, for instance, I picked this out of a newspaper just last week. Rules won't save Twitter, but values will. I think finally there's you know, a big audience out there that is starting to realize values need to be articulated because they're very important for us to us as users. And uh, here, another one from the public sector, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter and Microsoft have signed a voluntary EU hate speech code. This is a really important you know, uh, step for them to take because it's not really clear what hate speech is and how they, it should be controlled. But you know, their intention to include this value into their, more and more into their, the design of these corporations, that makes them more responsible players in the platform society. Um, I'll just skip a few of these, but of course we need to help update regulatory frameworks. I will give this talk to lawyers and legal scholars all the time, but that's a very special issue, so I uh, will skip that for now. This, I think, pertains particularly to uh, Estonia, and I'm uh, very, very interested, interested in seeing this, but I think we need to stimulate the development of more non-profit and public platforms. European countries have been notoriously lazy or lax in uh, defining their own you know, systems by developing uh, public platforms. I think that's a major, very interesting way uh, to not just generate intellectual capital, but also uh, to generate more, um, you know, citizen-based uh, uh, support. Um, I also think that by investing in public expertise and public sector, we're supporting the development of more open systems. And that has a lot of advantages, more competition, more diversity, more you know, intellectual capital injected into that system. And actually, you know, now that we're here in Estonia, for me, Estonia is a lighting example of uh, a long-time model for innovation by government services. So actually, Indrik and I just went to the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Information, and we talked to um, Sim Sikut, do I pronounce it correctly? Okay. Um, we talked about a whole range of government services that Estonia has developed. E-residency, e-voting, government services from health to education. And I think, you know, that whole idea of the government as a platform, government promoting public services in an open, open data, op based on open services, is a very good idea. Not just from the market perspective, from the economic perspective, but also from a cultural perspective. And finally, and that's my last word to you, is of course we're here with a large number of scholars from a multitude of disciplines. And I've been excited over the past few days to uh, realize how many of you are involved and interested in sort of working on this wicked problem together and especially I think by you know looking from various different perspectives from a, a number of scholar scholarly backgrounds like from economics to you know cultural policy from informatics to uh, you know philosophy I think all of this interdisciplinary scholarship is extremely important to solve these wicked problems. Because public values, I always say, cannot be left to engineers alone, or lawyers alone, or economists alone. I think they really need people from, you know, especially humanities and social science, to develop those, that public value-centric system together. Um, so, you know, we may help them make sense of 
algorithmic governments, of, of setting up new you know, institutional frameworks for understanding how these ecosystems work. So this is really my last slide. I think the implications of platformization on our societies, they're really, really profound. And those systems are currently actually shaping the very fabric of our society. And that's why I'm so emphatically, you know, I'm so tremendously um, invested in help, asking you to help to change and to, to build basically that system, to keep it more open, to make it more public, and to keep it fair and to keep it open for democratic control. So I really think we need to reflect on how we want to govern European democratic societies that are increasingly invested in and um, uh, dominated by different ecosystems of platforms. And whatever you know, the future may bring, I think the least we can do as European societies, you know, there's a number of them and very different from each other, at least we need to reflect on those before we you know, just go along with the flow. And that, I think, is important, that we need to get more control in our thinking over how those flows of information rule the world. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And we now have a few minutes left for questions, so just raise <laughs> your hands and the microphone will reach you. So, take mine. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm Luciana from Brazil, and uh, you finished mention, uh, mentioning some challenges. Uh, I would like to ask how, you, how do you see these implications of uh, platformization on, on cultural content flows? Because what we see is that um, also um, we have more people accessing cultural content on big platforms yeah. such as Netflix, Spotify, etc. And I would like to hear f uh, from you specifically on, on this flow of cultural content online. Yeah. Well, very important question. I, you know, I haven't even come around to talk about the content. Uh, I focused on the fake news problem because it's so widely uh, known by now. But one of my next sectors, I promise, that I will dive into and that I'm going to um, explore in more detail is especially the creative or the uh, audiovisual content sector. I think it, it's amazing how much effect uh, these platforms have on local and national industries of cultural content. The one thing that I, you know, am a little familiar with is, of course, the um, public broadcasting systems. In the Netherlands, for instance, we have a huge public broadcast system. 40% uh, of our national uh, audiovisual content on television comes from public broadcasting. But their major competitors right now, well, they had first had the commercial stations, which is now, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, very common, but now of course what's coming in is uh, YouTube as a competitor and Netflix and all you know the cable cutters who are turning directly to uh, these content providers. Now YouTube is an interesting example because it sort of sets a standard, a totally new standard for what cultural content should look like and how it should be and it can be distributed. Um, I can ta talk about it from many angles, but for instance, the, the public system has never you know, come to acknowledge that uh, uh, basic services like YouTube would be a competitor in the first place. And they are not, to some extent, uh, uh, you know, a real competitor in terms of television content, but that becomes increasingly blurred as YouTube allows larger, um, you know, longer uh, uh, videos online and is starting to compete in, also in terms of television production. I think the keynote tomorrow will be partly about this subject. So, you know, may I refer to our keynote speaker tomorrow, Josef Straubhauer, who will definitely talk about this issue. And he's much more knowledgeable about than me about in this field. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. Ah, there um, you are. Uh, Sorry, I'm looking at the light. But. I, I thought that was really, really fascinating, really rich. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to take you back to the start when you talked about um, the variety of models around the globe, and particularly the distinction between the US 
and the China kind of model. And I just wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the differences and similarities yeah. between those, partly because it strikes me that um, the distinction might not be meaningful or might become increasingly less meaningful, partly because, um, at least in their management of these infrastructures and these platforms, they have the ambition to behave like states. Yeah. Um, and I think that's significant in terms of a distinct, distinctive forms of governance, but also because in, I think in both instances, there are ways in which these platforms are not, they're not just interrelated with one another, they're also interrelated with states. Absolutely. And, and I think that's quite yeah. an important part of the, the future discussion. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it would be another two hour lecture just to talk about this, but you're absolutely right. They're both both separate and they're intermingled. And you have to look at it from you know both these sides. They're separate because, you know, indeed in China, state is sort of, you know, uh, issuing corporations to do part of the surveillance work for them and through them. In America, of course, there's it's the other way around. The corporations are in charge of uh, the system, but they're actually helping very much the state in terms of surveillance. Now, over the past weeks, you may have seen uh, an interesting uh, story about uh, Google, particularly, who started in America, started to work with uh, the Defense Ministry of Defense in, uh, on very advanced AI systems and using their data toward that end. Um, of course, that's what's happening in China all the time, and it's like, you know, that's part of the basic uh, structure of that system. The interesting thing is that the, uh, in the United States, uh, control of that state, um, uh, how do you call it, the state corporate um, uh, accumulation or whatever power, um, where we see resistance coming is from, uh, in this case, employee, Google employees, who last week were uh, becoming very, you know, uh, vehemently spoke out against Google in uh, uh, helping the government to control surveillance systems. And they may be an interesting new, what I call, civil society force to sort of go against that accumulation of power. Now, there's... So they're, they're, they're uh, similar and they're different. And one of the interesting things that uh, we can see right now is that look at the financial flows. Basically follow the money where the Chinese ecosystem is based on and the American system is based on. I always thought until last week that the Chinese system was completely controlled by the state and also subsidized by state money. It's not true. And I realized that four out of five of those big companies are actually um, uh, stationed, their the headquarters, corporation headquarters, are stations in the, in the Kaiman Islands, not in China itself. Um, so the, the basically the relationship between state and, uh, and capital and, and corporate capital is changing, has been changing very much over the past few years. And I think we really need to study this very closely. I haven't done so. I just realized it last week that the capital flows are so important in understanding how these ecosystems work. And the other thing, the other part of that is that um, I mentioned how Spotify, for instance, is now owned 20% by uh, Tencent. And what we see increasingly is that Chinese and uh, American corporations, the big tech, are sort of intertwining not only their expertise, but particularly their, uh, uh, their share flow. So that's another venue that I want to look into because the financial flows are very much sort of undergirding this whole ecosystem and how it works. And a totally, you know, apart from that, what we're seeing in the mechanisms, the mechanism part of that story, the technicalities, is that they're very, very similar. They're using the data flows and the algorithmic governance towards, you know, in a very similar manner, but towards different goals. I mean, you have, you know, the Chinese uh, sesame credit system, of course, which is very specific in how surveillance works at the state level. Uh, but that is sort of mirrored by the American corporate system who increasingly, you know, those platform uh, mechanisms are actually uh, together, they also form a sort of surveillance system that may not be the same as the Chinese system, but it has some similarities to it. And that's also an intricate venue that I want to do more research on. Sorry for this complex answer to your very interesting question. Yes, there's Let's a take the question from there, and unfortunately, this has to be the last question as of this session. 
Yes, please. Ah, you're waiting for the microphone. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to point, basically, you are pointing to public values as one of the key problems here. I think that, in essence, this can be also in economic terms, seen basically as, uh, firstly, you have to define with what good are you actually dealing here. Because I think we're not dealing with purely private good, but probably from the start, this has been dealt as left totally to the private companies. So, I mean, in principle, multi-stakeholder governance seems like pretty idealistic solution. Yeah. Uh, you need more stronger measures, yeah. and of course, public values, okay, it's a very soft concept, but first you need to decide um, on what type good are you dealing with and what type of institutions, what type of market structure you basically need to deal with uh, those issues. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, a lot of people say, well, why do you uh, make this distinction between public values and, for instance, economic values? Because the best public values are all actually also make economic sense, right? So I totally agree. I think that's, that's really true. And one of the, uh, I want to point out a book, a reference to a book that I, you know, just came out in May. It's by Mariana Mazzucato and it's called The Value of Everything. Uh, this, it's exactly about this problem. So, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. The more public value you put into your, uh, you know, your corporate value, the more valuable, in fact, your corporation becomes. So that, I think, is, you know, the right venue to choose from uh, here. Now, on the other hand, I think we need to distinguish that notion of public value in order to state what, for instance, our uh, you know, values like democratic control are, what it means to be responsible. If you just leave it to corporations who call themselves you know, uh, the, the world's connectors or uh, you know, Google's logo, like, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Google wants to help everyone and connect the world and, you know, we're not going to get very far if we just believe them and believe the blue eyes of their CEOs if we want to, you know, buy into public value. So what I think we need to do is really um, make explicit, articulate what we mean by uh, responsibility, what we mean by accountability, because so far, if we look at, you know, the different legal uh, uh, discourses, you see that, for, you know, tax evasion, um, privacy laws, uh, you know, information law, uh, antitrust law, you know, if we just leave it to corporations, they're not going to take responsibility. As I said, you know, they're only taking responsibility after being pointed towards their public responsibility. So that's why I make it, uh, you know, turn it into a real point to make the distinction. But I totally agree that that value, that kind of public value, should rest with corporations in the first place. But they should behave as responsible societal actors, not just market actors. So that was part of my uh, argument. Thank you very much for this totally... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Very inspiring and uh, thought-provoking. Well, if you have any keynote. more questions, I will be here for the break. <laughs>